When this week began, I had a uh, pretty good idea of where my sermon uh, would be focusing on. After all, today is the Sunday in the church calendar when we remember the baptism of the Lord and renew the sacred vows that we made at our own baptism. My intention was to draw your attention to and unpack three vital concepts that we find in today's scripture, repentance, forgiveness, and confession. And I was going to close by describing how it is only through the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives that we can grasp our need to repent, confess our sins, and experience the joy and freedom of God's forgiveness. And then, on Wednesday, January 6th, Epiphany, I saw what you saw unfold in our nation's capital. A deep sadness tinged with anger and, I'll confess, disgust were the emotions that I experienced that day. I'm not going to show pictures of the carnage unleashed. I'm not going to repeat any of the vile and bellicose language peppering the speeches given that morning that riled up and unleashed the mob. You saw the pictures. You heard the words. You know who said them. What I am going to do is invite you as a follower of Jesus Christ to look with me at our passage of Scripture today and listen for the Word of God through these words of Scripture so that we can truly hear God's voice. Let us pray together. Well, oh God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. For we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Scripture for today is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, beginning with verse 4. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locust and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus of Nazareth came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, before I go any further, I can already hear some people saying, Preacher, I don't want to listen to a political sermon today. And if you're watching this online, I am keenly aware of how easy it would be for you just to hit that little X at the top corner and stop right now. But I ask you to, to listen for just a few moments. I ask you to simply take a breath, center yourself, and listen carefully to my next few words. I, I once heard a wise man say, we have to remember that one can be politically amoral, but one cannot make moral claims and not have political implications. As a disciple of Jesus, called to be a preacher, 
one part of my responsibility during our time together is to lift up and make plain the moral claims we discover in this passage. Another part of my responsibility is the same responsibility you have as a disciple of Jesus, to work out the personal and political implications of these moral claims, and then ask God for grace to shape us so that through our lips and through our lives, these moral claims are made plain for all the world to see. So what moral claims do we find in this passage? The passage begins with John the Baptist showing up, making moral claims. John's claim is that now is the time to make a break with the way things have been done. Now is the time to become aware of, acknowledge, and turn away from everything in our lives and everything in our society that is in conflict with our calling to be the people of God. Now both where John appears and his manner of dress are intended to remind us of important turning points in the Bible. So where does John appear? It says he appeared in the wilderness. Can you think of a major story from the Old Testament that marks the beginning of God doing something new that happens in the wilderness? You remember where, where Moses was when he saw the burning bush? Well, he was in the wilderness. And what happened there? God called Moses and sent him to Pharaoh with the moral claim that the evil, injustice, and oppression of slavery must end. Let my people go is a moral claim. And Pharaoh and his political and economic cronies didn't like that moral claim because this moral claim had profound political implications. That's why Pharaoh said no nine times before at last yielding to the unrelenting power of God. Now, do, do you remember where the children of Israel went after they escaped from Egypt through the Red Sea? They marched through the wilderness to Mount Sinai where God gave them the Ten Commandments. Now, what are the Ten Commandments? They are bedrock moral claims that have profound political implications. Do you remember the first commandment? I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. The first commandment is a moral claim. Therefore, by necessity, it has political implications. If the Lord alone is God, then it is to the Lord alone that we pledge our ultimate allegiance. When we pledge our ultimate allegiance to the Lord our God, our duty becomes supporting or resisting politicians and policies based solely on how closely they align with the moral vision we find in Scripture, the whole counsel of God. One grave temptation we all face is how easy it is to cherry pick a few verses and only pay attention to those to the verses that reinforce our biases, our beliefs, our business interests, our political inclinations. The lifelong work of discipleship is becoming more and more familiar, more and more shaped by the whole counsel of God, the moral claims it makes, and their political implications. This parenthetically fun fact for you, that phrase, the whole counsel of God, comes from a story in the book of Acts, chapter 20. Paul is speaking to the people in the church in Ephesus, a church in a town that was turned upside down by the political implications of the first commandment. Now John is showing up in the wilderness, intending, uh, John showing up in the wilderness is intending to remind us of all the times God used the wilderness to mark the beginning of something new. And whenever God starts something new, you better believe that there will be political implications. 
The wilderness is not the only thing that should spark our memory. There's a very specific reason Mark goes out of his way to describe John's clothing. You remember how John was dressed? If you've got your Bible, look at at verse 6. Now John was clothed in camel's hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. John's fashion is intended to remind us of another person who spent time in the wilderness making moral claims with profound political implications, the great prophet Elijah. In 2 Kings chapter 1, King Ahaziah, the wicked son of one of Israel's most wicked kings, sends people to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, to see if Ahaziah will recover from the injuries he sustained in a fall. The angel of the Lord is sent to Elijah and tells him to go and intercept the king's emissaries and directs them to say, is it because there is no God in Israel that you're going to inquire of Baalzebub, the God of Ekron? Now, quick question. Which commandment has Ahaziah broken? Well, it's the first commandment, isn't it? Elijah intercepts Ahaziah's people and sends them home to tell the king, Thus says the Lord, you shall not leave the bed to which you have gone, but you shall surely die. When Isaiah hears this, he asks them, What sort of man was he who came to meet you and told you these things? Their answer? A hairy man with a leather belt around his waist. And Isaiah immediately knows it's Elijah. He knows it's Elijah because Elijah was the person God repeatedly sent to make moral claims with profound political implications to his father, King Ahab, starting in 1 Kings 17. Why did God start sending Elijah to make moral claims to King Ahab? Well, if you've got a Bible, look at 1 Kings 16, 32. Ahab took as his wife Jezebel and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. So which commandment did Ahab break? Well, that's the first, isn't it? Shortly after that, God sends Elijah to start making moral claims to Ahab and Jezebel. The political implications of those claims are so profound and they so anger the king and queen that Elijah has to flee for his life. Ahab so hated Elijah that in one of their confrontations, Ahab describes him as the troubler of Israel. Ahab, Ahab succumbed to one of the most dangerous temptations that people in power face. One of the dangers that people in power face is coming to believe that God's moral law does not apply to them. And they refuse to accept the consequences for their actions. And quite often, after this happens, they will not hesitate to use violence to silence people making moral claims. And we see this happen exactly a little bit later in the Gospel of Mark. In chapter 6, we discover that, like Elijah, John the Baptist gets sideways with the king and queen. King Herod doesn't appreciate John uh, making moral claims about the inappropriateness of him marrying his brother's ex-wife. The moral claims John makes and the political implications they implied ended up costing him his life. But that's the end of John's story. Here at the beginning... He shows up in the wilderness announcing a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. So what does repentance mean? True repentance means a conversion of the human heart. By the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, our eyes are opened and we see the world in a whole new way. We see the ways in which we personally have violated the moral claims of the gospel and in so doing, are personally culpable for breaking God's shalom, which is God's design for creation. 
True repentance is accepting our personal and corporate responsibility for vandalizing God's creation and hurting other people. True repentance is when we stop pretending that everyone else is the problem or that it's those people fault, whether they be uh, MAGA supporters or Antifa. We discover the most incredible joy and freedom imaginable when we realize that Alexander Solzhenitsyn was spot on when he wrote these words in the Gulag Archipelago. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it necessary only to separate ourselves, separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. As I watched what happened in Washington, D.C., I caught myself sneering in disgust at those evil people. But then, in a moment of grace, I heard the voice of Jesus saying, why do you see the speck in your brother's eye and do not notice the log in your own eye? When, when I realized that, when I heard and remembered those words of Jesus, I realized that I, like a great many people in our country today, have already or very nearly have elevated our political candidates and political identity to the status of God and thereby are breaking the first commandment. John the Baptist said, one more powerful than I is coming. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It is the grace of Jesus that Jesus gives us through the power of the Holy Spirit that helps us notice the logs in our own eyes, that brings to our awareness those places in our lives where we are transgressing, transgressing God's moral law, where we have or are in danger of breaking, especially in this time, the first commandment by raising some person or political identity over and above our allegiance to God. My prayer for you and for our country is that we will all earnestly pray for Jesus to baptize us with the Holy Spirit so that we as individuals and together as a nation experience the renewal of life that happens when we confess our sins, truly repent, Join hands and work together to build shalom in our homes, our community, and our nation. We began the service with that beautiful hymn, America. And I just want to remind you of that line from the second verse, that prayer, that plea. God, mend thine every flaw. Let our prayer be. Oh God, start healing our nation by mending all the flaws of my own heart. Amen and amen.